Hospital Porters Pride and Dignity stopped the New World Order. Welcome to her Panwo TV and welcome to this UFO Academy Watford 2017. Oh, at Watford Junction, now this is a railway station in uh, Hertfordshire, just north of London. Now, I'll just give you a quick 360 because it's quite a strange place. I mean, I'm on this little sort of like siding because, like, Watford Junction is like a really big station, it's got like 12 platforms, but I'm here on platform 11 and I'm the only one on the platform. And it's just like this little side thing here, this little, this little I had to go down a little alleyway to get here. And I'm here now. And it's a nice peaceful spot. You still hear the, the loudspeakers in the distance. Um, talking, announcing, things like that. But, oh, blimey. I got up at five this morning um, to get to, to where I am going. And, um, yeah, so I only slept about five. I didn't sleep four hours, I slept about three hours. A good old fashioned portering night, a portering early shift, I was going to say night shift. A good old fashioned portering early shift. Um, but I'm actually I'm heading to Garston, which is um, just two stops down the line. And from there I'm going to walk to where I'm going. And someone else just, someone, a second person has just appeared on the railway station. So I got on the, um, I got on the coach. Um, I got the coach to London. And just about, there was a few drunk students, people like that, sort of coming back from parties and things like that. And um, yeah, and I thought, and I sort of tried to sleep on the coach a bit and couldn't, so I read a book. When I got to West London, I had a bit of a shock because I didn't realise this, but I've driven past it. Well, I'm not driven past it. I've been on the coach going past it for so many times. But you you got you enter um, sort of Kensington Shepherd's Bush area and there's these like big <coughs> tall tower blocks and one of them I was one of them sort of I thought was covered in sort of black scaff a black kind of scaffolding wrap but then I realised it was Grenfell Tower I've been going past it on the coach for all these years and never realised what it was and now of course everyone across the world knows the name Grenfell Tower and it was burnt it was just burnt the whole thing was burnt to a crisp covered in black soot and I never really it's only when you see it the TV pictures don't do it justice when you're driving past the bottom of it and you're looking up and how big it is and how how different it looks to the other buildings around it covered in black soot and you get an impression of the conflagration that consumed that building and so many people within it no one no one knows how many died. I don't think they'll ever know because there were lots of illegal immigrants living there as well who were not documented. But right now the, f the fire brigade are going through trying to find the bodies and they're taking them to the hospitals and the hospitals are having to deal with the, with the remains, the human remains from the, from the disaster. And um, well if I hadn't been kicked out of the portrait that could have been me doing that. It's not nice. I've done, I've had dealt with people in who've been in fires, it's not nice. And when you look at the, the, the size of the fire on TV, in many cases, not there's not much left to find of the bodies. They're just poor, poor people, council tenants. And they've been, they were neglected, their building was a fire risk. 2009, there was another fire there, six people died, and you'd think that would make people take action, but they didn't. So to see it for yourself with your own eyes is, is different to seeing it on TV. It really is. So I had a bit. It was quite shocking to go past that building and see it towering above the skyline, all covered, all black and broken and gutted by fire. Yeah.
Oh, there, I think, is some kind of train wash. I think it's like a, you have car washes and you have train washes, so the trains go in there for a cleaning. It's, it's, it's a nice thing when you, you get to these little parts of the station where you see more of the functioning of the station. There's a maintenance, there's a maintenance train over there. That's where they do the railway maintenance. The weather's quite nice there, actually. It was warm when I came out. I brought my, I brought my uh, jacket with me, just in case, because we're going out sky watching later. But um, while well, it was really warm enough for me to walk to the coach stop without my, without my jacket on, which is this t-shirt on, this bases t-shirt, which I'm wearing, very appropriate, I think. Uh, so, um, well, uh, you're wondering what I'm doing. Well, um, this. This part of this part of the UFO disclosure 2017 series is called disinformation, but this this particular segment is not about disinformation. This is um, my reportage of the High Elms Manor UFO UFO event. Kerry Cassidy awake and aware. I might even actually make this into a separate video. I'm not sure. I might not make it as part of my UFO disclosure series. I'll see how I feel. I might put them all together I might make two, two different videos but um, I'm going to uh, go and see this event now someone put a comment on my, on my last video upload it was Jews oh I can't be doing with this crap I says let's have some more let's have some more UFO stuff Ben let's have some more UFO things so I'm doing another UFO event so I hope you're satisfied with that it's another UFO video so that's good, I hope, because I know that's what you want. And I know a lot of people like them, so I'm going to do another one. Um, oh, excuse me. Oh. Anyway, um, I'm just waiting for my train. It should be here soon. And then it's just a short six-minute journey off to my station. So I'm just going to enjoy the peace and quiet for a while. So, catch you later. I've just got off the train. I've made myself a rather crude map here, as you can see. Try and find my way to where I'm going. As you can, but uh, oh, it's uh, still going to be a long time. I'm going to probably get there just when the gates are opening. Doors are open. I'm not sure. I don't know exactly how long it'll take. But um, yeah, I'm uh, going to a conference. I hadn't originally been planning to go to this conference actually, but then because um, of work. But then, um, <coughs> basically, one of my cli my client I work for at the weekend, and now she was gone on holiday, so it suddenly turned out I had some extra a weekend free. So I thought I'll go. Oh yeah, so uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, I'm just looking forward to being at the Hillel Manor, which is, uh, as I said, it's kind of. Uh, the atmosphere is a kind of uh, close encounters versus uh, meets uh, Brideshead Revisited. So I always compare it. So, uh, here we are. I may have to find my way back here, but I think Colin's going to be. Colin's going to be there, so I'll meet up with him and Sandra and a couple of other people later on after Sky Watch. I'll probably go off with him. Now, uh, it's good to be going to a conference because I've had a... I mean, you know, when I get to conferences, I mean, you've seen my videos, you know I get a bit kind of manic, don't I? I get kind of hyper. Um, at the end, I, if it's a good conference, at the end I can uh, fall into a brief, but a very intense period of depression as you go back to so-called normal life. It's, uh, so I've never, I've always... I've always been a real conference animal. I was actually banned from a conference. I don't know if you... You may have heard about this. I did mention it on the Hapanwa voice blog. And also, Tino did a video about it. I was banned from the Outer Limits magazine conference. And it's all to do with this business with Larry Warren. I mean, because I'm... <coughs> on one side, I'm, I'm one of Larry's most vocal defenders. And the Larry Warren hate cult, which is what I call them, were attending the Outer Limits magazine conference, and uh, well, uh, the organisers decided um, it's easier and quicker just to appease the hate cult, and by banning me rather than banning, or, or just 
asking them, you know, can you knock it on the head for 24 hours, which is what I suggested. I offered a 24 hour unconditional truce. I just said, look, let's go in, let's just enjoy the conference, let's come out of the trenches, trenches and play a game of football, you know? But they weren't having it, apparently, so that was it, I was banned. <coughs> it's, uh, this all ties in with the disinformation subject of this film. I, um, I don't believe that Larry Warren hate cult are dis disinformation agents. I think they just they just are doing it because they are they they just have an appetite for destruction and they're doing it for their purely personal motives. However, I think they're being used by those who are disinformation artists. So their 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 line is convenient, conveniently appropriate, which is why they're being used. It's an odd thing, you know, to dedicate so much time and effort to the destruction of another person. It really is. But a lot of people do it. I've had them in my life. I've had Droik, Team Droik, all of them. And what they've done, they've spent... They, they, they basically, together, they worked full-time simply for, to giving me... simply to harassing, to denigrating me. Um, it's so bizarre and sad, it's, it's pathetic, it really is. <coughs> so, I know this is a conference, no, one, not gonna, no one's going to ban me from this conference. I mean, I wrote to them and said I was coming and they were pretty pleased. They said, I'm paying on the door, you know, but they put aside some tickets for me. I'm going to come this way. It's quicker. What's the worry? There's a railway bridge. Yeah. These are really old railway bridges, they're nice. So, uh, let's have a look anyway at the speakers and the itinerary for today's event. So, this is where I'm heading the UFO Academy at Watford. <coughs> and this is the Kerry Cassidy Awake and Aware UK conference. So let's see, see who we have. Well, first of all, we have Kerry Cassidy herself, a documentary filmmaker, investigative journalist, and well-known talk show host of Project Camelot Whistleblower Radio. Yeah, it's, um, I do, of course, everyone who knows Kerry Cassidy and um, who's, who's in this business. And um, she was even at the Basis Conference a couple of years ago, and I got the chance to work with her on stage, which is really, really great. I really enjoyed that. And her YouTube channel and the Project Camelot is one of the most important one of the most uh, popular of the various um, YouTube channels and various other po um, projects and uh, media outlets in this field. Peter Paget, right, yes, this is a guy from who uh, advised the British government in the early 60s. He's written a book. He's written a book called The Welsh Triangle, which is all about the famous um, UFO uh, UFO that happened in Wales in 1977. It was uh, 10 years ago. Oh, sorry, no, 40 years ago. And it's a decade, that's what I was saying. He's done work on E.T. crop circles. <sighs> Excuse me. Um, he may, may be an insider. Considered by many to be an insider. And has raised a groundbreaking disclosure in Basis 48 at Warminster. Yeah, so, um, yeah, that was interesting. I remember I was there. Mm, so look forward to that. Michael Shrimpton. It's the Germans. I think that just about sums him up. Um, oh, Maria Wheatley is very, very interesting indeed. She is an expert on Stonehenge and ancient monuments. Um, she's discovered these strange skulls, which uh, seem to be some kind of creature that's not like normal humans. And this is, these things were found a long time ago, but no one's really looked at them until Maria. Um, and so this could change history, or at least it'll be a long time, but it's uh, really quite... Um, it really take quite a... Um, quite a long time before obviously normal you know normal knowledge catches up with people like us <laughs> but maria um is also a dowser and she does like a uh, dowsing and things like that so uh, which is really quite fascinating her, her father got her into it who sadly passed away and now she's um she does courses on dowsing i've been to one myself they're very very good ah uh, my old mate tony topping yeah he's uh t tony is uh i look forward to seeing him um 
Oh, hang on, it's not opening. Tony's page is not opening. Well, okay, it says Tony Topping has had contact with ETs, UFOs, and ETs from an early age. Yeah, he's, and he's talked about a special briefing. Apparently, this is an exclusive. Tony tells me this is a brand new talk he's going to give. Well, you can hear it at, also at the Roswell 70. Um, he's going to give it there too. But I'm looking forward to seeing him and talking to him. And then we're going sky watching. Yeah, 8:30 p.m. Now on Sunday, <coughs> this is uh, interesting. We have Simon Parks, who was a uh, chap who was at the Repcon. A man who's had long, long life, lifelong experiences with mantid beings, draconis, reptilian, feline, and small grey creatures. He's uh, an elected politician. He was a, a local councillor in Whitby, North Yorkshire. And um, he's been uh, attacked by the mainstream media, and he has. He, he has been attacked really badly and ridiculed. And he's one of these guys, he's, he's lucky actually, because he's one of these guys who just I don't give a shit, you know, just say it. And <laughs> he's not bothered. So that's good. Hugh Newman, I've not heard of before. Um, oh yeah, I think yeah, megalithomania. Yeah, he's a megalithomaniac. Yes, I think I'm, I think I heard of him from there. But he talks about the author of Earth Grids, Secret Pattern of Gaia's Sacred Sites, co-author of Giants on Record, Americans' Hi America's Hidden History. Um, oh, it's, it sounds very interesting. He's written for Atlantis Rising, New Dawn, Nexus. That's why I must have heard of him because I read Nexus regularly, and he organises the megalithomania conferences, and I've been to one of those. They're really really good. And he lives in Glastonbury, which is the best place to live for people like him. Uh, Miles, good old Miles. Yeah, you can't have one of these conferences without Miles. Miles is going to be there doing his stuff. And, well, I'll, he's organising some conferences coming up. He's speaking at Roswell 72. Uh, at, at, sorry, 70 as well. <coughs> and um, I'm interested to hear what he has to say this time. Should be interesting. Right. Peter Paget is back again. For a second helping. That's really, really good. Yes, we got uh, Peter Paget, and then um, oh, there's going to be an Indian meal with the panel. Twenty pounds at the restaurant. Um, I'll probably sort of head off with um, my other friends actually, because I don't get, often get the chance to see them. Um, so I will do that instead of going for the meal, uh, the, for the formal meal. So, um, but it looks really good. I'm looking forward to it. It really, really, really should be good, and I can't wait. And um, excellent speakers. I know loads of my friends are going. And it'd be just so good to see them. Oh, I just uh, can't wait. Oh, yeah. Um, it's really just... It's, it's the get-together side of things, I think, which is more important, really, than the speakers. Um, so, oh, now I'm heading there. Let's see what happens. Right, I found an alleyway that leads up by the side of this housing estate and I can get from here to High Arm Manor much quicker, which is good, because I don't want to be late. It's not the easiest place to get to if you don't have a car. Um, as I say, Garston's the nearest railway station, but it's a good uh, good half hour's walk from there for a civilian. For a hospital porter, of course, it's much less. But, uh, well, I've been out of hospital porter in a while now, and um, I do, you know, it's a fine, uh, maybe I'm losing, I'm out of shape a bit, maybe. I don't know. But, I shouldn't because I mean I, do, I get exercise at work, I do gardening and things like that. But anyway, I'm heading uh, up this alleyway to the venue. Should be there soon. And here we are, I remember this well, although last time I came here I drove in. But this is it. Yeah. Please drive with care, I'm not driving. Now this is uh, one of the loveliest sights in ufology you're about to see. High Old Manor. It's a good old oldie worldy Lord of the Manor, you know, um, Pride and Prejudice, Middle March type um, stately home. And and there's just uh, no other UFO venue place like it where you get a UFO conference. It's a kind of like a seems hard to believe actually that um there we are high arms man and there it is I don't know I think I'm on time so uh, quite a, quite a life this house has had I mean I think it's about I think I looked up somewhere it was say 17th century and it began with the Lord and Lady and all their servants and they'd sit around you know, on the terrace drinking pims with their little 
furry wigs. Those white furry wigs. And then, um, all these years later in the 21st century, it's a venue for a UFO conference. I mean, you couldn't make it up, could you? I bet they never dreamed that, that would happen. <laughs> they really didn't. Look at the ivy going up. I don't know. It's, it's ivy going up the wall and everything. It's, got, it's really atmospheric. So, here we go. Better pick up your ticket. And of course, I forget you don't get tickets in this place. You get the stamp on your hand. Mm -hmm. How about that, you see? You're marked with an alien. <laughs> it wouldn't be the same without that. I don't think it really wouldn't. <laughs> so that's yeah. how they know who, that's how they know what I've paid and I'm in. As you see here, I mean, this is the back side of the building. And uh, there we are. And look at that. Look at the uh, ivy crawling up there. And there's a... There's an ivy-clad gazebo there. And just look at... I'll show you the lawn. Um, look at that. Can you just imagine the old uh, pheasants and peacocks strutting around, can't you? And, uh, and Mr Darcy and... Um, What's the, what's the Rebecca and what they're called, whatever their names are. And that is an old, I think that's an old cedar tree. I'll have to take a closer look at that later. I have done a video here before, but I had to delete most of it. I don't know if you remember. I, that, that there is, there are a few, I did manage to keep a few of the, a few of the clips are still on my channel, uh, but I had to delete some of them for legal reasons. And there's a little fountain. I did another, I spoke here actually. I mean, I don't know if you remember, but I actually spoke here last year. And there's, that video is on my channel as well. I'm not speaking this time, um, I'm just listening, I'm stitching and listening. Um, I'm hoping I don't fall asleep because I only slept a couple of hours last night. Here we go. Right, we've only got a brief break. Just heard Kerry Cassidy um, and she talked to me about uh, disclosure having two factions. Uh, it's very, very interesting um, to do with whether there are good aliens and bad aliens. Um, it's a complicated business, but she had a big argument with Dr. Stephen Greer about this. Because Greer thinks all the aliens are good, and they had a big bust up. It's quite, you can see on YouTube, it's quite an amusing <laughs> little tussle there. But um, uh, well, basically, Kerry has 550 Project Camelot videos, and she's been interviewing Captain Mark Richards, who again has to has to deal with the bad aliens. Again, blind there, and um, there are beings from Alf Deborah, which is a star. I think it's in Taurus. I'm not sure, um, but. She goes into the prison and she's not allowed to film Mark Richards, but she writes down stuff with, with a pencil on paper. And um, then she basically records it when she gets out of the jail. She, she just remembers as much as she can. She makes notes with a pencil on paper and she just records it as soon as she can before she forgets. Um, and she says that there's wars in the Middle East to do with. Hi, Mike. It's right. Won't be a sec. Won't be a sec, mate. The wars in the Middle East are to do with the Stargate, and that's. Um, and that's quite interesting because I've heard things like that before about the stuff, various things that have been found in Afghanistan and Iraq and places like that. Um, there's an agenda called Humanity 3.0, and um, it's, the chemtrails come into it. There's a new documentary called Franken's Sky. Someone sent me a link to Franken Skies. I've not seen it yet, um, but um, it's a new film about chemtrails. And she mentions Childhood's End, which is a, a book by Arthur C. Clarke. It's not his best book. It's, it's probably his worst one, his worst novel, but. It has a lot of these interesting themes in, so it's worth reading. It's quite a short book if you get bored with it, but um, it's very, very it's interesting. And um, the flat earth thing, now Kerry, Kerry, Kerry Cassie is not a flathead, I'm glad to say, but she does think maybe the idea of the flat earth might come from the idea of four-dimensional space. Um, I can't do a longer reportage on this particular um, speech because we've only got a ten-minute break and then it's Peter Paget. So, uh, see you later. Right, I'm just going to... Head over and have a look at this tree because there's this lovely tree here. So you can see, like, this old cedar tree. It's probably as old as the house, actually. About three or four hundred years. And it's just beautiful. And I'm going to have a look at it now. Um, now, Peter Paget has been on, and he's always a. It's funny about Peter Paget because this came up a little while ago, but I sometimes think that. Um, everyone's maybe too informal in the world now. When, when people are relating to each other, in Britain maybe, I don't know if it's for other countries, but in Britain especially, I think people are too informal sometimes. And you, you get this kind of, like, um, buddy culture. And, um, you see, because when I see Peter Paget, um, this is a man twice my age, well-dressed, um, very well-spoken and educated, and 
So I, when I met him, and I did that to when I met him today, when I, when I met him before at bases, I said, oh, Mr Padgett, how are you, sir? <clears throat> and it felt cheeky not to sort of address him formally like that. And um, so that's... I do sometimes think, you know, you know I, don't, I wouldn't feel comfortable going up to a man like that and saying, hey, Pete, buddy, how you doing, mate, Pete? Yeah, you know, it just wouldn't feel right. Look at that. That's a cedar tree. Oh, no, they, they, when I came here last time, there were nuts on the branches because these mazy cedar nuts with the, the oil which comes out of them. I don't know if you've ever read um, The Ringing Cedars of Russia. The, the book's about the, the woman Anastasia who lives in the, the forests of Russia. Um, but anyway, I said, look at that. That tree could tell some stories, couldn't it? Look at that. Like, wow. That trunk there. Hello there. Oh, yeah. Hello, old friend. How are you? That's amazing. Um, well, Peter Paget's and I mean, Peter Paget likes a controversial character. You get like, um... but anyway, he um, he's written a book called. He describes himself as a spook, which of course is um, um, it's a Dutch-derived word meaning a ghost, but it's also a nickname for a, a spy, a secret agent. And he talks about a lot of things. Ape-human hybrids. Now I've covered this. Uh, it was Joseph Stalin, actually, who did experiments on hybridising humans and chimpanzees. Um, monotonic gold, oil slicks. Now, um, Peter Paget invented a, a method for dispersing oil slicks, which is still in use today. Um, and he talks about the Russians, and he's saying, and he, he why has he said, you know, the Russians aren't the people in control, the Russians aren't like the people behind everything like you talk about, it's Trump and the Russians and stuff like that. Um, he said that humans have been on Mars before, and I could well believe that. And he believes that the Anunnaki actually were extraterrestrials who used humans on Mars and on Earth as slaves. This ties in with what Credo Mutwa was saying, based on the Zulu legends. And he also talked about Sidonia. Now, this is something I've covered as well. Sidonia is a region on Mars where there are distinctly artificial structures, most famously the face on Mars. But there are a lot of others as well. And... Um, it's it's quite a remarkable. It's quite remarkable actually because um, uh, Mars used to actually have a very very different environment. It's today it's it's airless, it's dry, it's dusty. There's a very very thin carbon dioxide atmosphere. It's very cold. But it used to have liquid water flowing over it, and it used to have oceans and rivers and lakes. So it must have had a much thicker atmosphere long long ago and it must have been an awful lot warmer. Um, estimates for about three to four billion years ago, so that's an awful long time, um, that before life had really evolved properly on Earth, Mars may well have been a green planet, and maybe there were creatures there in the distant past. And that when Mars went dry, they, they all, some of them went to Earth. And it's possible Sidonia is the relics of that lost era, the incredibly old structures. I mean, three to four billion years, I mean, and no artificial structure on Earth could last that long, but perhaps on Mars where there's no rain, there's no wind, they last longer. And funnily enough, Sidonia is about would have been on the seaside at that time. Um, there's a book called Two Thirds, which is worth reading. It's by, I can't remember the names of the authors, there were two authors. One of them's David Percy, I think, who did the moon landing book. Uh, Mary Bennett was involved as well. Um, it's worth reading that. Now, um, they had anti-gravity, yeah, that fits in with Two Thirds as well. Um, Judaism, Christianity and Islam all come from the same origins, I can well believe that. Solar sun worship, things like that, solar worship, astronomical things. Um, now, um, Paget doesn't use the word UFO, he calls them IAX, Identified Alien Craft, and this is rather like Steve Bassett talking about using the right words all the time. So, uh, well, um, I'm not sure I go along with that. But um, I still call them UFOs. But apparently um, we're being mind controlled. He talks about cardboard coppers as well. Now, I've talked about this. Uh, that you find them in shops. They have actually cardboard cutouts of policemen in the windows. And this is actually psychological. Apparently, this image of a policeman cuts down shoplifting. It's like psychological, subliminal um, deterrent. You must have seen them, they're known as PC Boardman. It's quite funny though, because one of them got stolen once. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, um, identify an alien craft, yeah. Um, but Peter Paget talks about other things. He talks about how people have been disappearing from national parks in the United States. And there's this guy I've got to talk to, actually, who wrote this book called 441. And, um, 441. Um, that's people just keep disappearing from national parks when out on holiday. Um, Planet X, he's... I'm not sure what his position is on Planet X. I'll have to ask him when I speak to him. I've just been talking to him, actually, at lunch. And um, I think the chance that I should have just pushed him a bit on that. But um, he believes that people shouldn't have free energy because he believes that if we had free energy, we would abuse it. You know, because, and there's some... There is this kind of, like... I suppose there's some justification for that concern because... Free energy has been weaponized, as Dr. Judy Wood has discovered. It was used to destroy the World Trade Center on 9 11. Um, so, generally, generally an interesting chap. I did find him interesting. And it's Michael Shrimpton next, so uh, let's go in there and find out all about them pesky Germans. It's an ivy clad gazebo. I'm thinking of uh, Gone to Seed, my favorite TV series. But I've got to come in here and have a. It's beautiful, this. It's lovely, what, what they've done here. Isn't that lovely? This is in the, this is in the, in the grounds, and, my, and Colin has just turned up there. You can see, there's old Colin. Yes, yeah, so I'm getting a good, good little shot of him there. He has appeared. And um, we're just in that. We're just in here now. Um, Michael Shrimp hasn't quite finished, but I've come out a little bit early, because uh, I, I'm, it's a question of scheduling my... These little video reports I'm doing. There's the, there's the cedar tree there where I was earlier. Now, Michael Shrimpton, yeah, and um, he talks about a lot of things. Missing nuclear warheads, um, the Westminster Bridge attacks, um, all the things like that. And it basically the Manchester attacks, Grenfell Tower. Basically, the Germans did it, as I said. It's not an exaggeration to say that. He thinks, um, he seems to regard Germany as the, all the evil in the world comes from Germany. I mean, I, I, my last video was I did a thing about Jews about how some people be, believe J Jews are behind the New World Order. Shrimpton believes that Germans are behind the New World Order. I mean, it's funny, he said that um, the DVD, which is uh, not the disc you watch films on, it's uh, the German intelligence agency, is basically in the new Gestapo. The Gestapo, after the fall of the Nazis in 1945, became the DVD after that. <coughs> and they did West Westminster Bridge. Apparently, they had a plat plot to assassinate Theresa May, uh, and they used, uh, and they, they control these Islamist terrorists. And uh, Khalid Massoud, he didn't operate alone. He he actually uh, didn't drive the car. I mean, he he was driving the van, and he shouldn't have driven the van. Um, the plan was to actually um, cut Theresa May's head off, and then blame it on the Muslims. This was all designed. This is all punishment for the Article 50 triggering. Um, he mentions that Christopher Brooker and Peter Hitchens are the only good journalists in the world. I don't know Christopher Brooker. Peter H Hitchens is a very good journalist. Um, seven seven was the was a German plot as well, and the guys weren't suicide bombers. The the the, the men who blew themselves up. Um, the Grenfell Tower thing that was uh, th that was German intelligence again. It's a punishment for Article Fifty. Uh, the murdering of Joe Cox again. German in German agents killed Joe Cox again. This is all to do with with the EU, which Britain's exit from the EU. Um, the Nazis were behind the EU, apparently, and I've often said, I've said this though that it's true that, that Hitler's um, Hitler did plan to, ch to change the Third Reich into the what he called the Europäische Vereinschaft after the war, and uh, Europäische Vereinschaft means European Union. Um, what else? Yeah, uh, he said a lot of other things too. I mean, you see, I mean, I, I don't believe, I don't agree with him on these things. I mean, I've spoken to Nick Collistrom about Westminster Tract Seven Seven. Nick, Nick Collistrom, he's written a book about 7-7, which indicates it was, it was an inside job, and that the, the so-called bombers were patsies. So, um, I don't go along with him on that. Um, it, the, most, the, the weirdest thing he said was he talked about um, a covert German space programme. Now, we all hear about the secret space programme, right? But he's got, Shrimpton's got a very, very unusual idea about the secret space programme. Um, he says, basically, it's German. Um, like everything else that's covert, secret, underhand and dirty in the world, it's German. Um, and he says UFOs, UFOs are basically uh, German, right? It's basically what we call UFOs, all craft that are created by the German secret space program. 
Right. And the whole idea that they're extraterrestrial is a complete fabrication generated by Major Donald Kehoe and um, because uh, Kenneth Arnold, who were German spies. Um, so they're not ET. UFOs are not ET. Well, no, I don't have to. I don't have to go into details about how what, how nonsensical that is. It's true there is a secret space program. It's true there are unusual aircraft from all nations, but this in no way accounts for the entire UFO phenomenon. Um, so I, I asked him a question about Helen Duncan, and he said well, basically Helen Duncan had contacts with the intelligence agency. She wasn't a real medium, but basically the Germans conspired to have her put away through because they were blackmailing. Um, it seems like politicians who are gay and secretly gay and the Germans were blackmailing them um, things like that um, so that's a good summary I mean that's a good summary of Michael Shrimpton I hope that's fair I mean I don't agree with him but I mean he's a very entertaining speaker he's a good guy I, I like the guy uh, he's very very excellent speaker very very entertaining speaker indeed and um, he's been he was very good to Margaret Hahn who who's, I've spoken about on previous programs who was the granddaughter of Helen Duncan and is trying to get her pardon, so credit where credit's due. I don't think the Illuminati are the Germans, though. It's, uh, the Illumin it's far, far more complicated than that. Right, I'm just, uh, Maria Wheatley has been on, and uh, she's such a good speaker, she really is. Um, very, very passionate and informative, and she's got a real style about her. Um, and she, she did a speech I've not heard before. I've not come across, um, what, I've not come across what she, uh, this particular subject. Uh, partly, I mean, she talked about the long skulled people, um, and which again ties in with what other people have discovered where there's, there's p human, humanoid beings with strange shaped skulls. And also the, t the Stonehenge, the truth about Stonehenge. I mean, Stonehenge um, was not built in one go. I mean, it's one thing that Maria has looked into. Um, it was built in several phases. Even conventional archaeologists say this, you know, over a, a, quite a long period, I think over 2,000 years. Um, but she, Maria says this Stonehenge Phase 1 is different to Stonehenge Phase 2. Stonehenge Phase 2 is a solar temple, but Stonehenge Phase 1 is a lunar temple. Um, so it's more um, feminine, it's a goddess-worshipping uh, um, goddess temple. And um, it's, she believes that the, the Long Skull people created that. And the Long Skull people were all exterminated by the Round Skulled people. Um, about around about 2500 BC, there was a genocide. The round, the round skull people killed all the long skull people. Um, the round skull people, of course, is us. Uh, not, not that I'm guilty about that. I don't believe in uh, racial original sin, um, as I've said before. Um, but that's just a fact. That just happened. Um, and archaeologists don't want to know about this. I mean, Maria, when Maria was on her Panmo radio, she talked about the fact that she'd come across this information that had been sitting around for ages, and she was the first person to even look into it. Um, one thing very interesting she talked about was during, on the evening before the summer solstice she said she went down there with, with Kerry Cassidy and these limousines pulled up with darkened windows and um, which meant that some very very important people were going to Stonehenge to take part in the in the evening before the sunrise ritual I had to ask her if she recognised any faces um, yeah now there's a lot of ground water, I mean, she talks about water, deep water. Um, it's, it's a myth, you know, that the earth is divided into air, ground, water. I mean, we, we see strong dividing lines between these. And if you look at a map, for instance, or, an, or a satellite picture of the earth, you can see there's distinct areas where there's water and there's land. However, it's not as, com it's not as simple as that. I mean, the land is more like the head on a point of beer. There's caves and things like that. And some of those caves have water in, and there's vast amount of underground water. Um, Probably more than probably it probably exceeds what's in the oceans, and um, it's we all know that, the, that even in desert areas like the Sahara, it's well known fact that Colonel Gaddafi was going to actually um, feed Libya or turn Libya into a, a green a green belt, an African green belt, with huge farmland by tapping the aquifer beneath the Lib Libya, which could have, with which there is trillions of tons of water. Um, yeah, and she talks about how um, there's some this cover-up. I mean, the National Trust, or the National Mistrust, as she calls it, covers things up. 
and um, interferes, interferes with rituals, it vandalises monuments, and it's starting to monetize things. And she said that you, you can't get into some of these sites now. They're going to charge you, like even Avebury now, where there's a village in the middle of it, they're going to start putting a turnstile on the gate, so you can't even get in there. And she's already had trouble like that, because Maria is a courier, she does tour guides of these, she does tours of these areas. Now there's pyramids everywhere. I mean, I, w I should point out also that Maria, Maria talks about ley lines and about how it would, be, it would fit in with the ley line system to actually have the prime meridian at Stonehenge rather than at Greenwich. And this, is, this makes sense that it, the Illuminati would actually move things from their natural place to an artificial place. I've said this before, I've talked about the calendar being artificial. Um, they, they, so they change everything natural into something artificial. Now, um, there are pyramids everywhere. Pyramids in Aleppo in Syria, and that's where they're fighting the war now. And I wonder if this ties in with what Kerry Cassidy was talking about when she talked about stargates um, in, in the Middle East. And in Peru and in Australia, there's this one called the, the, the Jimpai Pyramid, which, well, the historians say, well, that's the early, the early European settlers built that. Well, if they did, what, why would they build a pyramid in the middle of the desert? And why wouldn't they leave any records? Why wouldn't they tell people they'd done it in their memoirs? Um, pyramids, uh, the Merlin's Mound is very interesting. We, well, I, I've done a whole video about that when we had the basis conference there. Silbury Hill is a pyramid underneath the, the, the soil. It looks like a, like a cone, like a, it looks like a kind of flat top cone, rather like the Oxford Castle Mound. But inside its structure, there is a um, stepped pyramid in chalk. And what's more, the top was cut off in more recent times. Um, <clears throat> there's a spiral path leading up Silbury Hill, incidentally, which, and there's rumours of like people, there's, there's historical rumours of people um, walking in a spiral pattern up Silbury Hill. Interestingly, on Mars, in, in, in Richard, what Richard Hoagland talks about, the Mars mirror, the equivalent, the, the, the spiral mound there, also has a spiral path on it. Um, this, um, there's pyramids in Sudan, um, and um, in, in North America, and Maria actually lived in North America for a while, she lived in the United States, and there's all kinds of pyramids there, which were very similar to the European ones. And Sardinia, a massive number of pyramids in Sardinia, ancient sites with... Um, with uh, wells and caves and things like that. Absolutely fascinating to see what she talks about. I've got to get her back on her Panama radio and do another interview because she really is brilliant. So that's Maria Wheatley. I've really enjoyed that. I should add that um, this is, I think Maria realises this. There's, some, there's, there's a sinister side to this. I was mean, talking about the changing of the natural to the artificial, which is what the Illuminati did in terms of the calendar and the prime meridian, etc. But they. Um, there's everything, this whole. Everything's done. Is this separation of us from our ancestry and from our legacy, our heritage, and our inheritance, our spiritual inheritance, is deliberately there so to destroy us? So these these ancient sites and, and the culture that goes with them represent, and the energy and, and the work that Maria does, it represents a threat, a threat to the new world order, and that's why it's happening. Right, well, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, we had Tony Topping, who I thought was going to be the last speaker today, but Kathy Morgan has turned up. Uh, I'm, I didn't know she was going to be in the area. Um, well, I can't remember, was she on the itinerary? I can't remember. But um, she's taking a little break now. Um, Tony Topping's beyond, and as always, he was. He, he seemed, goes into an altered state of consciousness when he's on stage. And um, he, he almost like he's channeling, and he <coughs> talks about the space-time continuum, and he talks about um, how UFOs are connected to time travel, and I mean, time travel's an odd thing, because um, I just wrote an article on time travel, actually, because um, it, was, it was kind of like uh, some Australian scientists have just done an experiment on the observer effect on quantum particles and waves, and I'm sure you know about that. Um, it's worked out that actually the, the particle, the, 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 part, the wave particle collapse actually happens before the observer which means that in a sense the effect knows it's going to be observed in the future Now this is means that basically it's evidence for backwards time travel um, backwards time travel is completely different from forwards time travel and forwards time travel is actually comparatively easy um, it's very anyone can do it all you have to do is travel very fast in fact there's a man called Valery Polyakov who has traveled one tenth of a millisecond into the future he did it by spending a year and two months aboard the Mir space station, which is like a, a Russian space station, a forerunner for the ISS, the International Space Station. And he, um, he travelled, it was calculated he travelled one-tenth of a millisecond into the future. If you build a craft that can travel much faster than Mir, 
according to Einstein's um, theory of relativity, even though he's a, a German agent, according to Michael Shrimpton, um, you, could, you could actually visit the distant future. The problem is you couldn't get back. Most physicists believe backwards time travel is not possible. However, this particular experiment, although it's only informational and it's in the quantum, air, it's in the realm of quantum physics, is the first evidence of backwards time travel. So maybe it is possible. Now Tony was talking about backwards time travel and forward time travel. Um, he talks about mind control, psychic espionage, the various experiences he's had in terms of the attacks where he hears strange noises, things like that. He talked about Wilbert Smith, who uh, was a UFO investigator for the Canadian government. Um, and Tony's been having experiences since he was two years old, where he saw Ganesha, this Hindu god, god with a head like an elephant. Um, and he believes that um, some the authors of some fantasy literature are actually describing scenarios that really happened. And he gives the example he gives is J.R. Tolkien and the Middle Earth, because he, he believes that Middle Earth, the Middle Earth sagas, like the Box Saga, which he talked about at Bases at the Barge, is I don't know if you've seen that video, but I did do a video about it. Is kind of a uh, is like a representation of a real event. Those guys are just setting up there for the Skywatch later. Um, um, he talks about the Wingmakers. Now, the Wingmakers is supposedly a piece of fiction. Uh, it's I don't know if you've seen it, but it's basically a story. It appears it's in novel form, but it appears to be a story about a secret UFO investigation team for the government who discovered these caves that were left by old ETs from long ago. And one of them, called Jameson Neruda, goes rogue and sort of like blows the whistle. Um, he talked about uh, the danger of influencing reality, because Simon Park said he influences the LHC. Tony says there's a backlash if you try and do something like that. Um, he talks about the Project Pegasus and um, the invisibility experiment, the USS Eldridge. <coughs> and then... Um, he talks about because he 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 talks about continuing. He used two volunteers from the, the audience to like he did a probe to demonstrate the, the past and the future incidents and with the present in between. Now he talks about he says it, he talks about a UFO incident that happened and he used as the past tense, but he says a UFO incident happened in t the year 2158 in San Francisco. Now. Um, Obviously, that is 140 years into the future. And, um, well, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how many vitamin C supplements I take, I ain't going to see it, and none of us are. But, according to this model, though, that space-time is not like... He's, he's almost like a Doctor Who going on about a tiny, timey-wimey, wibbly-wobbly thing. <laughs> um, and he talked personally as well. He, he discussed something very personal to himself, which was... Um, he talked about this relationship, he's spoken before about a relationship he had with a female E.T. Simon Parks, of course, is well known for speaking about his own sexual experiences with extraterrestrials. Tony has said that he has had children, alien children, with this E.T. He believes he has a baby daughter who is actually in the E.T. world, which is, he's the father, and this alien woman is the mother, so... Yeah, so it's, um, he was obviously emotional about this he thanked us very much for listening he was weeping a bit on stage and he was obviously emotional I mean, you know respect to Tony you know he's a good guy I like him he's a good friend um, he's invited these people around though who have cameras um, I don't know who they are but it's like a, a film crew I mean there's like three of them and they've got a proper camera I don't know who they are yet um, I try and find out obviously you know my feelings about getting television involved with, with things like this and uh, Tony you know, I just hope Tony knows what he's doing and it's a lovely image there of the sun catching the tr treetops at dusk in the shadow of the house there. And, um, well, for Cathy Morgan, uh, was was very good. Cathy Morgan was really good. Um, she's, uh, I'm familiar with her work, and I mean, I know her well. Um, she um, she talked a lot. She talked a lot about some new things this time. For instance, um, covert covert public studies. Um, so that public, in other words, experiments were done on the British people without their permission, and it involved studies into courtship, which is like putting men and women together and seeing how they get on, whether they're attractive and things like that. And 
But the, one of the most serious, one of the most um, sinister things was the Peckham experiment. Now, this is one I hadn't heard of before, but the Peckham experiment was a psychological experiment done in the 1960s on children. And it involved um, none other than uh, J. Arthur Rank, who's a very, very famous film producer, um, who's made lots and lots of different movies. And um, J. Arthur Rank, of course, was behind the Children's Film Foundation. That, and these were, these were films that were shown sort of in, when I was a kid, they were shown in the after school times. And you get like a, a feature film, especially aimed at young viewers, which would, was made by the children. I remember the Children's Film Foundation, the, the, the title card was like the, um, these pigeons in Trafalgar Square taking off. I remember that. And I remember some of them. There was like one about some people who had model planes, and there was a. There was this guy, uh, yeah, Profe yeah, Professor yeah, Popper's Problems, and uh, la, 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 la. apparently these were all psychological experiments. And um, there's this thing called Q camps. Now the Tavistock Institute was involved in this. Kathy always talks about the Tavistock Institute, and I've had a long discussion with her about that because of my own involvement, which I've talked before about a Tavistock experimentation. Um, and um, they had this thing called Q camps. Now. Um, that's to me the very name Q camps is very very sinister because um, the, num the letter Q often refers to something that's fake, something that is is, this is committing an act of deception. For example, a Q ship in the war is a, a is a warship that's disguised. It's, it's disguised to look like a a merchant ship, or a fishing boat, cargo ship, or something like that. But really, it's a warship. It's got hidden weapons behind fake. Um, cargo containers and things like that, and it, and it would sail. It would sail itself um, covertly amongst the fleet, and then suddenly the real flag would go up. The false flag, literally, would go down, and the real flag would go up, and suddenly it would open fire on the ships, and they'd be, they wouldn't be able to fight back. So Q, the letter Q, Q cams, just sounds very, very sinister. And she believes that the Grenfell Tower, not the fire itself, but putting people in these sky dungeons, these big tall blocks of flats breaking up natural communities is a part of this uh, psychological warfare. Very, very interesting lady, Cathy Morgan, and I'm very, very pleased. I'm very pleased to have seen her again. It's nice to talk to her again. She's a lovely lady. Oh, no, there's a pussy, there's a pussy cat down there. Hello. Hello, little pussy cat. Now, lovely. Little pussy cat. It's lovely around here. It's not like uh, this thing, these people around here. Now, um... That's the sky watching. It was to be done in a minute. And um, I'll just see if I can find. I just want to show you something. There's these TV cameras going around. I don't know. Still don't, I'm not still on the shoe now. Tony totally Topping. Um, Tony Topping seems quite confident these are that they're going to do a good job. But they just asked me if I'd take part in a shoot, and I said no. I said no, and they said okay. I mean, I just, um, you understand that I'm wary of everything else that's been going on. See where they are, have one moment. That's our auditorium in there. There's Kathy packing up. Okay. Um, I'll see if I can find them. One moment. And we have a rainbow, yeah. It's, it's raining slightly and there's a beautiful full arch rainbow there. I don't know if you can see it. It's should be visible. Oh, look at that. Oh. Now get a load of these. Get a load of this. Look at these flying saucers, UFOs. <laughs> this is the absolute perfect suite to have at an event like this. UFOs, yeah, and flying saucers. UFOs, they're called flying saucers and UFOs. Oh, look at that. And that's just perfect. And I wonder, shall I try one? What flavour are they? Here we are, it's a pink one. I'll, I'll, see, what that, I'll see what that tastes like. Hmm. Oh. Mm. Well, they're kind of sherbet -y. They've got a kind of... Hmm. They're very nice. Hmm. Hmm. Aliens never tasted so good. <laughs> now, that there is the cameraman. That's the cameraman. With these people from the media. And, um... Well, um... That there. That's the director. Um, there's, I think there's someone else as well. There's this young chap walking around with them as well. So, um, well, who are they and what do they want? Just if you've seen them before and they, they've made shitty programs about UFOs, just let me know, okay? Right, they, there they are. They're over there filming now. I'm just going to sneakily 
film over Do you want there. to use me as a sort of like yeah, a... Yeah, just hide behind you, yeah. Uh, hide behind Philip there. There they are, they're, they're, they're over there doing their stuff. Now, um... Yeah, yeah. Philip. Now, um, I don't... Like I said, they, they, they wanted to film a big shot of people here around this table, this table here. I, I, I stood to one side, and I wasn't going to let them film me. And I mean, I, I'm sorry if, if they make if they make a good program about UFOs and conspiracies. I will apologise to them, and I will always trust them in the future. But you got to, in this business, you have to assume people are, gu are guilty until proven innocent. Because because what look look at the track record. Confessions are mainly abductee. The world's greatest UFO conspiracies, UFO conspiracy road trip, or the the seven seven one, the nine eleven one, which are all awful. Yeah. So we can only judge them on their track record, which has been, yeah. quite frankly, abysmal. So That's putting it mildly. I think the best policy yeah. is to ignore these bastards until they get their arse in gear yeah, exactly. and their acting gear yeah, exactly. and, and come up with the goods, because thus far, the captive licence player is just... Uh, yeah. Is there anyone else who wants to just do a quick... No thanks. No, <laughs> no thank you. <laughs> Not a chance. Mm. So, Colin, can I can I put you on a panel TV? Uh, Is yeah, that right? Uh, Colin, where, where are you going on Monday? I'm going to Roswell. Then I'm, you're going to uh, Roswell. You've heard about Ooh. the day after Roswell. Oh. That's the year after Roswell, 1948. Yeah, yeah. oh, I just yeah. want to get that gag in. <laughs> Very good one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Very droll. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, yeah. So off to Monday. Not sure what to expect. Flying out to Dallas. Mm. Um, Got to wait a few hours to get a flight to Roswell, but hopefully I'll be doing a bit of a talk about it in your uh, Roswell 70 event. Yes. So uh, maybe some exclusive photos of, um, you know, what, what it is to be out in Roswell, basically. Um, I'm not sure what to expect, but you can't not go to it if you're into the subject. And um, it is the 70th anniversary, so um, we'll yeah. see how it goes. And um, maybe, you know, maybe there'll be some revelations. I'm not expecting them to trawl out, you know, to bring out the Roswell crass vehicle or, or, or bodies or you anything. never know <laughs> yeah well yeah well you know um you're gonna you're going to two roswell 70 um events this year well you're going to one in this country too, yeah so it? yeah so i'll be talking at your one so hopefully Absolutely, i can yeah. show a few um photos from my trip and uh, hmm. yeah i mean hopefully it'll be in the news again yeah, yeah. Maybe a little bit on the alien autopsy. Yeah, that's Lunch, right. Yeah. Wink, wink. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Really. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and you're going to try and sell copies of Roswell and Rising. I am. <laughs> and my, my expert salesman over there is going to. Philip, well, I personally was a book agent for Hans Rouge, oh, the world's right. leading scientific anti. Are you recording this? Yeah. It's all right. Yeah. Do you, do you I, mind? I'd love like to get this in. Because you were on the pro. Yeah, sure. Come on. I, I personally <laughs> was a book agent for 15 years for a gentleman who's. His name was John Rouge, from, he was a Swiss medical historian, and I sold a, uh, 200 of his books entitled A Thousand Doctors and Many More Against Vivisection, banned in every bookshop in the whole of the, the world. Basically. Oh, that's, well, that's yeah, pretty so good, isn't it? Yeah, so, that's, uh, yeah, so I hope to do equally as well for about a magnificent uh, treatise. Well, that's then. pretty good. I mean, that's like about uh, 0.25 doctors per book. <laughs> yeah, you have to sell, eh? Yeah, we're selling them for 10 US dollars, yeah. we're selling them for, which is a discount. Well, so if you're, if you're in Roswell, just find these two guys and I'll, I'll sell you a copy of Roswell Rising for 10 US dollars, which is one dollar less than you get it on Amazon. Um, it is available in the US now if you want to buy it there and then worldwide. But, um, and then of course, it will be on sale at Roswell 70. I've got, I've got to order some more. That's a good reminder because I've got two, just two weeks now till Roswell 70. Yay! <laughs> so, uh, well, we've got the, the sky watch is going on. We're just waiting for the saucer to land on the lawn now. So, um, when it does, I'll start filming again. Well, um, now we're actually at the. I'll switch the low light off a minute. That's um, amazing. I don't know. We're actually at the Skywatch now. I don't know how much you can see here, but basically there's a van here that belongs to John Lennon Walson, and there's this big telescope here. There's this. See this? I don't know how much you can see here, but there's like a huge telescope, and it's looking at Jupiter, the planet Jupiter, which is that there. That's the planet Jupiter. Which I, I can see Jupiter. <laughs> That's Jupiter. So they're looking at the planet Jupiter with that telescope and they're getting a really good image. I'll just show you the image on the screen. Do you see that? That's Jupiter and its moons. You can actually see Jupiter and its moons there. Um, so it's really, really great. Um, really great video there. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm, doing, I'm doing my video, Neil, so I'm just doing a video as well. Mm. So, um, so John, it's, it's alright, mate. No, it's okay. I'm just, uh, thanks very much. So you can see it.
They, I've never seen Jupiter looking like that before. You've got the best position then. I know, but... Look at that. Can come over here? I will, if you want, yeah. Oh my goodness. Go ahead. But that is just such a, an amazing thing. Look at this, look at the telescope. You ever seen a telescope like that? Let's have a look at this telescope. Now this here is the telescope. I don't know much of this you can see. I'll just put this low light on. That there is the telescope. It's huge. And this is tripod. It's as tall as me. It's taller than me, this telescope. It's the most amazing thing. And so that's what we're doing now. We're, we're but um, unfortunately at the moment we're actually um, watching Jupiter. But, but I mean, it's very, it's interesting to watch Jupiter. But I, I, I want to see some UFOs, want, like I did in Devon. <coughs> I want to see what I did. What the kind of things that we saw in Devon just a couple of weeks ago. If you watch my video there, watch my video about that if you haven't seen it already. Where there was like orange lights above the fields and things like that. What I'd really love to happen is for a big flying saucer to land right in the middle of the lawn here. Come down right in the middle of the lawn. Da, 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 da. Just think about that. Mm. Well, I've got a bit of an update on the, the camera crew that I was showing you earlier, right? Um, I asked, I got to speak to the director and ask a few questions. And they told me who they were. They're actually a private. They're a private production company, and they're commissioned to the BBC. It's part of the one. It's part of the one show. They're doing a clip for the one show. I thought, right. <laughs> so, uh, well, that answers my question, doesn't it? Um, but I did say to. I did say to them. I mean, look, if you, if you make a good program about this subject, then you. Um, You'll be creating an exclusive. It'll be an exclusive. I just say, you know, give me a chance. Make a good pro. You'll 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 see my congratulations because you make an exclusive. But uh, well, my hopes are not high. Put it that way. And uh, well, as I said, you've got you. When it comes to this sort of thing, unfortunately, you have to consider them guilty until proven innocent. But there's there's, a, there's something going over. Look, it's a oh, it's a plane. It has an aircraft. We're looking looking for UFOs. Da, 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 da. Come on, man. Well, a big saucer. That'd be an exclusive, wouldn't it? Big saucer lands in the middle of the field. The BBC would never let you show that. They would not, honestly. They wouldn't. Mm. Like it. I will, I promise you, yeah I will. I'm doing my own video as well with my, I'll, 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 I'm suffering from camera envy, but we, we, <laughs> I'm doing my own video. We, we want to show that, you know, yeah. we want to show that, oh, cool. anything. Well, I'll let, I'll, you, well everyone you'll know, if, if you see anything weird you'll know, because we'll be, we'll be going, oh no, what's that, what's that? That's an aircraft there unfortunately. That's what, what's that? Hmm. That's the planet Jupiter, and uh, that's what, but have a look, you can actually look, they're actually filming the planet Jupiter right now and it looks really, really good. You can see the moons and everything. You can see the four moons of Jupiter. Can't see much from here, but uh, oh, amazing. So uh, let's wait and see what happens. Okay, we're just uh, sky watching right now. Um, so a couple of things that are a bit um, interesting. The thing is, it's only about 10 p.m. It's all probably about half 10. Um, I'm just getting out of the way of the camera shot. And um, there's like a, a couple of lights, it could be satellites, because unfortunately at this time of day, when um, it's about half ten or so, sun, sunset in this time of year, it's only just, it's only like a bit dark for less than an hour, so it's still light up in low Earth orbit, which means we're, we're, catching, reflection, sun, we're catching reflections of sunlight on satellites. And so when sky watching at this time of night, it's, it can be very confusing. Satellites, after a while you get used to them, they're just little, they travel in a straight line, they, they glow up, they flare up and they die out. Um, the International Space Station, of course, is a big bright light, because it has its own internal floodlights, that moves across the sky. Um, now the, um, the BBC are there, doing their stuff. And their floodlights and stuff like that, filming everyone pointing at the sky. Um, so I'll take a, make sure I avoid that. 
The house is looking lovely, all lit up. Very nice. It's a lovely atmosphere out here on the lawn. But I still want, I still want to see an alien spacecraft land. Calling occupants of interplanetary craft. Calling occupants of interplanetary, most extraordinary craft. Yeah, definitely. Hospital port has pride and dignity. Stop the New World Order. Welcome to Panwo TV. It's Sunday morning. I'm walking up along this little route here, which I walked up yesterday, to get to to get to the uh, Hyal Manor, Hanel's Manor. Um, I spent last night at Dave's place, and I've slept on his settee. It's very comfortable. I slept like a log. I needed to after getting up. I got up at five in the morning, <laughs> and I only got slept at three hours the night before. So. Uh, I definitely need it. And Dave was really, really great to me. He gave me, a, gave me some breakfast and had a lovely time. And um, now I'm heading for High Arms Manor, day two of this conference. I might not be able to stay for the end, actually, because I've got to get back and sort out my work for next week. And it means I've got to basically get home and before they, you know, before the end of the evening. Um, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting day yesterday. Thanks to all the speakers and to the organisers. <coughs> um, and um, I should point out—I should actually mention as a slight, uh, brief aside, um, because we're in Watford. Um, um, there's a new story associated with Watford, which, which I covered on the HPWA blog. I don't know how many of you read that, but it's it's basically, the, you know, I've got a series of, of websites, and this this is the one I use. It's hpwa. Uh, uh, yeah, hpwa.blogspot.co.uk, and it's the one where I cover hospital portering matters. And um, funnily enough, the Watford General Hospital, which is near here, has had a a major sort of like set to or a major sort of ruckus of broke has broken out. Here's the here's the alleyway I was on yesterday. Let's see now, um, it all concerns. Um, this port. Now, what happened is last week when there was all this hot weather. Now, my hospital used to get really, really hot in the hot weather because on large buildings they absorb heat and um, the temperature they tend to store it. So I remember being very, very hot when I was at the, when I was a porter at the hospital during hot days. I used to dread late shifts during heat waves because I knew it would be roasting hot the whole time. Um, now, uh, this porter rolled up the sleeves. No, rolled up the. Not sleeves, so because porters, porters used to we used to wear full-length shirts which were like ties and things like that. We don't do do that anymore. Most porters, most hospitals wear polo shirts. But um, this porter rolled up his trouser leg, but both of them. He's not not a Freemason. He rolled up both his trouser legs because he was hot and um, was suspended because of um, breaching uniform regulations. Um, it's quite. Funny. Michael Wood, his name is, my extremely proud and dignified brother, Porter Michael Wood. Um, and he, uh, yeah, and, and the, the, unless there's some people, I don't, I'll get past them, one moment. It's nice round here, isn't it? There's a nice, there's the playing fields there, and uh, it's a quick way of getting through to the manor. Anyway, uh, my extremely proud and dignified brother, Porter Michael now, because um, recently what happened was they recently made a request to have summer, a summer uniform involving knee-length shorts and that had been turned down for probably for infection control reasons. Um, but it's a serious concern. I've seen people, the temperature inside the hospital can reach uh, temperatures probably, I think they actually did have to shut down a couple of wards once because the temperatures went over 120 Fahrenheit. And they had to move the patients out. I remember doing it. We had to evacuate patients from a ward one day because it got too hot. Um, the obvious solution is to put in air conditioning. And uh, the trust, the trust, the trust directorship uh, refused. They refused to put in air conditioning in the whole hospital. They said it would cost, it would cost over eight hundred thousand pounds. It would cost thousands of pounds to run. And it's, to be fair, in Britain, it's something you'd only need for maybe a few days of the year at most. Um, and so they refuse. There is air conditioning in some parts of the hospital, including, of course, the trust director's offices. Well, they've, got, they've got aircon in A&E, 
but it usually malfunctions and it makes the room too cold. You have to wrap patients in extra blankets, I remember. But uh, anyway, um, what, what their union is, GMB, they don't have unison, but they're all pretty much the same, suggested is really quite funny. And they maybe have a sinister side to it as well. They suggested that porters, the porters will get round this by wearing skirts, women's skirts. And Michael Wood said, oh yeah, I'll do that, I'll wear a woman's skirt. <laughs> and I don't know, I mean... Honestly, I, I, something needs to be done about the, the heat in some hospitals during, during hot weather. The solution, of course, is to use air conditioning. Because, I mean, it's not, just, it's not for us so much. I mean, I've seen people collapse of heat exhaustion at John Radcliffe. Nurses, doctors, other porters, nurses especially, seem to be vulnerable to heat exhaustion. <coughs> um, there's, no, there's no official upper limit on how hot a, a room can get before you can say, well, we can't, we can't use this workplace because it's too hot. All you can do is, I mean, the, the, when we evacuated this ward because the temperature was 120 Fahrenheit, it, it was not because of any regulation. It's basically the doctors went and said, look, you, you have to move these people out, these patients, because they, they're, they're, they're getting heat stroke. And some of them are going to die because they're vulnerable and they're sick. And they're hurt. <coughs> but uh, you need something like that. You need, like, I mean, there's a lower limit on how cold. There's an official limit on how cold a ward can be before it has to be evacuated. They should just do the same for heat. The solution is, I think, inevitably, you're going to have to get air conditioning for the whole hospital. I'll come out on this road now, see. That's one of the entrances to High Elms. And, um... It's, they're going to just have to bite their tongue and do it. I mean, they can spend, they can spend £180,000 on, on simply doing up the on somebody making the front entrance look nicer and it's always the way in the NHS now all, all these state bureaucracies just make it just make it look nice then no one will notice how shit it is that's always the way you know, I can't paint over the rust these state bureaucracies are just like they're just like can you second hand car salesman now um, as for the skirt thing I mean I do wonder if there's some kind of cultural Marxist agenda here because I my mind tends to work in this conspiratorial manner. Um, now, trade unionism is something I got out of because of the cultural Marxism. Um, I, I spotted it very early on, luckily. Um, I was only hardcore for probably less than a year. And this was um, in, when I first started out in hospital portering, before I'd even turned 20. So I, I think I, I sussed it out and saw through it very early on. Some people, it takes their whole lives to work out what, how destructive it is. But, um, I mean, I, uh, so the, uh, I do wonder, because the thing about this, hospital portrait is what you call a male space. And there's very few male spaces left in the world because, um, the right to free association has been withdrawn from white heterosexual men. Although most, most hospitals are actually not white, but um, most of them are sort of foreign now. But um, the point still stands, I think. There's no... Uh, <coughs> you know, it's, it's one of the few male spaces left. And I mean, the reason, I mean, the reason the feminists don't object to that, because I mean, I'll say that uh, feminists have always been very keen on, on diversifying and enriching um, uh, any profession that is dominated by men. <laughs> by putting more women in, in other words, putting less men in. Um, but um, they don't object to hospital portraying because um, it's, a, it's a dirty, ungla unglamorous, low-paid job. They're quite happy, the feminists are quite happy to let the men do those. Um, so portraying has always been 95% plus male. Um, and as I explained in St Theo's, that was very important to me. And it's very important to a lot of guys to, to be in a male space. And I think this is what a lot of the a lot of the men and men now are deprived of, especially the middle class youth. Are, are deprived of that. I was lucky, but being working class, you still have that. If you but you if you want a male space, you have to do one of these dirty, unglamorous, low-paid jobs. Dangerous too, in many cases. If you're talking coal mining, things like that, working on an oil rig, still almost entirely a male profession. Um, so, uh, so I'm just wondering if maybe there's some making these uh, 
porters put on skirts. Funny thing is, they there was a news story a few days ago about some boys who went to school wearing skirts. And it's, it's maybe kind of gender confusion kind of thing here. And it's it's becoming more and more common. And I wonder if this a kind of a cultural Marxist style agenda here. Cultural Marxism does these sort of things. All right, how do, there's the high arms entrance, but how do I, that's how I get in from here. Anyway, as Ronnie Corbett used to say, on with the joke. Um, yeah, the, um, the BBC, right, I've got to tell you, I, I told you last night, didn't I, these people, these people with the big film cameras, not going to be there today, they did admit to me that they were working for the BBC. They were, they were, they were a small film company that was commissioned to do a, a sketch for the one show for the BBC. Very curious to see what it's going to be like, but my hopes are not high. Um, they were at Skywatch, filming everyone going like that, pointing at the sky. Um, now, uh, the, the thing is, I asked this young woman, this young Asian lady, and it just seemed like TV programmes today are generally produced by incredibly young people, mostly female, and mostly under 25, it seems. It seems most, that they seem to be the, the most common kind of film producers and directors now. Um, and this, this, this lady, she's very nice. You know, and I, I wasn't nasty to her, I just said, look, I'm, I, I managed to get some information out of her, though. She told me that the BBC does edit their programmes. So they, they have their own editing process, which they, and then they submit a, a broadcast cut to the BBC, of their, of their own, and then here we are, High Elms Manor. And then um, the BBC then edits that particular broadcast cut to make it suitable for them, what they want. So basically, that's how these hit pieces are made. It could be that the, 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 she doesn't want to make a bad programme. And I told her, you know, you know, if you make a, I told her, if you can make a good programme about UFOs, then... It'll be an exclusive. <laughs> and she's, oh, I will. I want to make a good program. I said, well, it may not be it's just her decision, you see. And she'll have to go along with it. Because if she doesn't, she loses her job. She doesn't get any more assignments. That's how the, that's how the system works. That's how the system protects itself. And here we are, High Elms Manor. Yeah. Back again. So, but I, I am going to watch it when it comes out. I'll probably, I might even write a review. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think it's going to be pretty uh, on the the bottom side of uh, excrement, is my prediction. Here we are. Lovely. And there's the beautiful High Elms Manor. Oh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with Steve. Now, Steve is a, a delegate. At this conference, so hi Steve. Hi, hi. Welcome. Now, I wonder what, what uh, how are you getting on? Are you enjoying yourself on this particular wonderful, event? Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you enjoy the speakers and everything? Yesterday, uh, a few I was a bit iffy about, but most of them were spot on. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Kerry was brilliant, and so was Tony. Tony Topping was wonderful. Mm. Yeah. I think that's the finest speech Tony Topping's ever done, actually. Oh, it so. was wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And do you, do you go to a lot of these? I know you went to the Basis Conference last, well, last year. Well, I've got Glastonbury coming up, so I always do Glastonbury, and then anyone that pops up, really. And I was also at the Nexus Conference in Australia last year. Oh, nice. So the year before that, yeah. Well, so. you certainly get around, because I'd love to go to that. So. Yeah, yeah, it's... it's yeah, I'm mm. a big, big fan of Duncan Roads and stuff. Oh, I, I never, never miss an issue. I subscribe, get it delivered. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Oh well, uh, hope you can continue to enjoy the rest of this. Uh, have you got a, your own website, or do you do any of your? No, own? no, no, no. I'm okay. just, uh, I'm just an observer. I'd love to be able to get up on the stage, but someone's always got it covered, like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Steve. Yeah, Thank yeah, you very no. much. I'm now here with another delegate. It is Milo. Hello, Milo. Hi Ben. How are you? Ah. Uh, Warming up. <laughs> it's just hot here, isn't it? <laughs> There's a lot of sunlight. Um, so you come here to the Watford UFO Academy? To, yeah, to, um, yeah. I've never been to any any of these conferences before, but this time I thought since it's in the UK, I might as well go. Have you travelled a long way to get here? No. 
Because oh, you sound like you come from the Netherlands. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, my mother has mad in the Netherlands. Ah. <laughs> come out Nijmegen, Limburg. Ah, Nijmegen. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a bit rusty. My Dutch is a bit rusty. She died in 2006, but my mother was a Dutch woman. Yeah. Um, but uh, so yeah. So uh, you do go to a lot of these events? No. no you don't. I don't. F first I, time. I, this is this is the first event. Oh right. What do you think of it? Ah. Uh, uh, some of it was intense. Uh, mm. Tony Topping's uh, his story is, is quite intense. Mm. Uh, most of it uh, I'm already aware of. Mm. So it's uh, many things were not really that new. Mm. But uh, yeah, so far Tony Topping's was. Yeah, good. He's, um, I've known Tony a long time. I think that was he really, really he, he went into a completely new kind of. Morning, Mr. Padgett, How are you? You don't have to be as formal as that. All right, Peter, will Peter, do. Peter, hello, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I was just talking about this yesterday, actually. Hi, Peter. But uh, yeah, so he was. Um, I mean, he gave out some information I've not heard from before. So uh, that was really, really How good of him. Um, he's, I'm organising a conference in Oxford. And he's going to speak there. So. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, uh, his story. We just have to take his word for it. But um, you know, there's. It's, it's almost impossible for us to to prove. Uh, empirically, what he's saying. It's tricky, yeah. It's very but tricky. It's tricky. Yeah. It's, uh, but on the other hand, um, from from where I'm standing, I have no reason to uh, to believe that he is not not sincere. Yeah. And I mean, I've, I myself have. I mean, he's talked about his encounters with various crafts, and I've actually been with him when these strange things appear above his head, right. uh, like lights that sort of swoop around in the sky. Not uh, definitely not all normal aircraft or anything like that. I mean, I've, I've been there when these things happen, so. I mean, I can I can vouch for that experience being real. Same here, same mm. here. I mean, since coming to the UK, um, uh, I've seen so many weird things buzzing mm. by in the, in the sky. Uh, after 50 counts, I stopped counting. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like there is something going on. No, uh, definitely, There's something yeah. weird. So, uh, you've been involved, you've been interested in these subjects for a while, but, but now you've come to your first conference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think you'll go to others? I'm not sure. Okay. No, okay. I'm not really part of a community or a society or a club. No, no. Right. Well, I might, I might see some others and might not. But, yeah, uh, no. but thank you very much, Milo. You're welcome. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. You too. Hello, everyone. I'm lying on this sort of ha-ha thing. It's just a slope you see here. And I've just been seen Simon Parks, and it's the sun's shining now. This sort of rain is coming and going. It's sort of like raining half the time and sunny half the time. But um, I'm um, just having a little rest now. We're having our early lunch break. I'm going to have to leave before the end, so I'm going to miss the last speaker or two, I think. Which includes um, includes Peter Paget's second talk. It's raining slightly on my face. But Simon talked about because um, he used to be a politician. He was um, a Labour councillor, and he, he <coughs> and. Um, he said that politics inevitably ends in corruption. He said there are good men and women in politics, but they get... It's just the whole system is designed to prevent them doing anything. Um, he called his speech Endgame, and uh, he talked about the Vault 7 declassifications, which proves things like what we conspiracy theorists have been saying for years about how Big Brother's watching you for your smart TV and stuff like that, like the telescreens. And nobody believed us. No, well, they say who who laughs last. Um, and he talks about Grenfell Tower not collapsing and things like that, and how it's basically manslaughter what was happening. And of course it was. Of course it was manslaughter because they basically it's, those people were killed through culpable neglect. Oh, that's better. Um, and the funny thing is, like. He talks about predictive programming. It seems like, see, Grenfell Tower was completed in 1974, and that's when the film Towering Inferno came out. And some of the publicity shots for Towering Inferno looked like the fire of Grenfell Tower. This is not suspicious. It's not the Illuminati did it or anything like that. It just it just proves that events can echo backwards through time, which is what I was talking about yesterday in terms of quantum um, um, quantum wave particle duality has been proven to work backwards in time. Um, so he he talked about the Simpsons, and the Simpsons in particular seems to have images that predict things in the future. They predicted President Trump. They predicted all kinds of things to do with Trump and 9/11. And, and there was this thing on Back to the Future, the film as well. Um, 
Now, one thing that seems to be predicted is that there's going to be an attempt to assassinate Donald Trump in October this year. And well, I've talked, I've written recently about the the, the the imagery in the media showing Trump dead. Uh, there was the, the Shakespeare play Julius Caesar, where you see Trump, who's Caesar is meant to look like Trump, and you see him being very brutally murdered on the stage. Uh, the, the stabbing scene at the end uh, shows a, a Julius Caesar who, who looks exactly like Trump. Being it's very brutal, you see, it's very, very graphic. You see his blood everywhere, you see his entrails. More than you'd normally get in a stage show of that play. Um, and there's Kathy Griffin, of course, holding up his severed head. Uh, he talks about the King Arthur film. I've not seen that. But, um, and the, the Hung Parliament. I've not seen the new King Arthur film. Um, the Queen didn't wear a crown when she opened Parliament. I thought it was just because she was getting old, but no, no, it's because... It's because it was a hung parliament. She didn't do it in 1974 as well. Um, now, this is where he was talking about. Tony Toppin was talking about this yesterday. Um, Simon Park carried out a med. Oh, it's getting bright now. Carried out a meditation to prevent the Large Hadron Collider ending the world. Uh, so, uh, but according to Tony Toppin, there's a backlash against that. You get, you end up with a backlash. Um, so he says the LHC is now harmless. He says Trump and Corbyn can't be controlled. But, and there's going to be a financial crash. Deutsche Bank is going to go down the toilet. Which he says is He says it's going, be, it's going to be the first stock market crash not controlled by the Rothschilds. And I find that a bit dubious, seeing as how stock market crashes are engineered. They're essentially engineered by reduction in money flow, and which results in massive de, uh, uh, deflation. So then you get people... Anyone with any savings in the bank tries to withdraw them. And any, any, any capital, all capital and savings loses value because of de de deflation. And that's when people try to get their savings out and then and then you get the run on the bank and the, bank, and the banks shut down. And that helped. So I don't know how that can be, how you can say that's not, that's not um, engineered because it's very easy to stop or start a stock market crash. And he also, then he, then he talks about He's got this thing going to win quiche, which is very, very, which I support, which is local bartering economy. You know, that's the, that's the solution, I think, if we just take economic control back into our own hands, like E.F. Schumacher always said we should. And, um, and the chemtrails. Chemtrails are something to do with, he says everything you think about chemtrails is true, but it's that it, working with harp, it's about suppressing the ascension of our spiritual things. I mean, it's, it's, it was, Simon, he covered a lot of subjects and I'm not sure to what to make of all of them, but he says that notion, he said something else very interesting, notional time is speeding up, and this is what I always thought. I thought it was the 2012 effect, but I haven't noticed notional time slowing down. That's not the, that's not actual time, that's not the actual time itself speeding or slowing, it's how fast it feels to be going. So, for instance, you say frames, you say things like, oh, time's fly, time flies, doesn't it, today? Time flies when you're having fun, and, um, oh, today's dragging, right? You're making an expression of notional time. Um, and apparently lots of people are saying that notional time is much faster than it was a few years ago. And it's not to do with the Mayan calendar, because it's still going on. If anything, it's accelerating still. You would notice some kind of slowing now after the years since the Mayan calendar. So I think it's Miles Johnston up next, my old mate Miles. He's been in PowerPoint lockdown for the last two days, and now he better deliver something good. That's all I can tell you. Here we go, here we go. <sighs> Calling occupants of interplanetary craft. Calling occupants of interplanetary most extraordinary craft. Bye bye, High Alarms Banner. <laughs> I'm going. I'm going home. That's it. I saw Miles. Miles was the speaker, and uh, I felt awful. Uh, when he was speaking, I felt really not well. I felt drowsy, and I felt like I think maybe I don't know what it was, but I was like feeling I could. I was. I almost collapsed. But he was um, talking about Max Spears and the tragedy associated there, and what happened with him. 
and he talked about scuttlers and the basis project, the Peasmore base and things like that. Scuttlers being these insectoid type entities, interdimensional entities that sometimes appear in places. You see one featured in Sandra de Roy's film Awakening of Twelve Strands. Right, now I've got to find my way home. I've left a bit early and there's still Human Newman. I won't be able to see Hugh Newman, I won't be able to see Peter Paget's second appearance. <coughs> but I've got too much to do and I've got to get all the way back to Oxford. It's just too much, too much to do. You know, got to go back to Oxford and I say goodbye to everyone, it's just something I hate doing. And as I said, I don't like the ends of conferences. It's quite nice to miss the end of a conference because it's just... Oh, but it's just so... Oh. It's very so heady, these events. It feels... I can't believe it's only five o'clock yesterday morning. I got up and I came here. It feels like longer. Oh. But Miles was as great as ever. My, I, I love Miles, he's brilliant. Yeah, of course he's not perfect, sometimes he talks complete crap, but he's really dedicated and a lot of his information, what he's getting out, is really, really good and he's been doing it since before most of us were interested. I mean, when he started the Basis Project, I was not on the UFO scene at all. I was... Oh, I was portraying Barmy and I was just like not interested really in stuff to do to do with it the paranormal. I had a vague interest but nothing serious. This is before the internet even really, or the early days of the internet. <clears throat> and Miles was producing these films on VHS tapes. Um, I was lovely to see people. I saw Sandra DeRoy was there and um, Dan, Dan Allspar from the chat box on um, the Herpano Radio chat box. He was there. I met a couple of new people. I've got some new contacts. And I'm like, that's what it's all about, isn't it? As I said, it's just it's the meeting people, it's the socialising. That's what it's all about. The speakers. The speakers are great, but it's just a chance. It's just an excuse to get together, isn't it? <clears throat> and now I've got to find my way home. Which means I've got to... I'm not going to find myself to wait to... Not, probably quite a long walk, because I've got to go all the way to Watford and find my way to one of the big Watford stations. I mean, I'm not going to Garston, because there's only about one train an hour. It's better to walk to Watford. I may see if I can get the bus. But uh, it's a shame I won't see Hugh Newman. Because um, he looks an interesting chap. He's got this book. He, he and this, this woman were selling this, this book, which she wrote with Jim Vera, called Giants, Evidence for Giants. And um, I think he's written for Nexus. There's been... As you know, I'm an avid reader of Nexus magazine. I get it delivered. I subscribe and get it delivered to my door. There was something in there about giants. I mean, see, giants are... Well, let's, uh, let's see what he has to say. So here's a little bit more about Hugh Newman. And yeah, he does sound a very fascinating chap. Giants, you see, he talks about giants, real giants. Um, now, as I said, he, he's written for Nexus, I'm sure, and I've read his stuff in Nexus. Um, and I wrote an article about this myself on her Panwell voice, about this thing on the, this little news clipping on the right of this picture. You see here, Smith, Miss Smithsonian gets a huge Indian skull. And they did, they got the skull of, uh, um, of a human, who, which could only have come from someone who stood over ten feet tall. And um, this, the, the local Indians in Nevada have legends of these huge, huge people who used to run around. They used to hunt and eat humans, these giant uh, giants whatever you call them, giant humanoids, they used to hunt down humans, normal sized humans, and eat them. <coughs> and um, it makes you think, doesn't it? I mean, this is, um, take a look at this. Now, you may recognise this. This is a still from a, a little video clip that you get on YouTube. Uh, I don't know, that 
there's only like it's only about three seconds long, but it shows uh, a scene. Uh, looks like some kind of street parade <coughs> in Japan. And you can tell by the flags that people are waving. And um, it's an old film, probably uh, turn of the 20th century, most likely, maybe around about that time. And um, you see this enormous man walking through the crowd, waving to the crowd, and the crowd wave, they cheer. And he's this huge guy. I mean, he, honestly, I would never fuck with him in the pub. I really wouldn't. I mean, he is like. He's got to be about 12 to 13 feet tall, and he's really big. And the thing is, you'd expect this is what this is what inter it's interesting about it because real giants wouldn't look the same as normal humans who are just bigger. They would have much more muscle mass because of the uh, weight to the weight to surface area ratio, weight to volume ratio, which is an, like an exponential curve. It's not proportional. So if something gets bigger, it's got to have more muscle mass to hold it up upright. <coughs> so. Um, uh, a human, if you just doubled a human in size, he'd just be, he'd be, he'd be full flat on his back because he wouldn't have the muscle mass to support his weight. Um, so I wonder if that's what he talked about at the conference. He may have talked about other things. I'd have to look into more about this guy. But he's definitely very, very interesting. And, um, well, I'll have to get hold of his book. Because, um, well, I've read his articles in Nexus, and he, he just confirmed to me that he's written for Nexus. So, and there's this, there's this book about someone called... Uh, What's the name of the author? He's got a very unusual name. Marius Boyagian or something. Um, he writes, he's written about the Solomon Islands, about giants on the Solomon Islands. And that's a book worth reading. I did have a copy of it and I had a glance through it once um, when I was someone at someone's house. Um, so check that out. Well, it looks like my little alien mark is still there, just barely showing. It does wear off during the course of the weekend. Well, I'm uh, just got off the coach and I'm heading for home. Home in Oxford, that is. <coughs> um... I'm kind of, um, I didn't stay for the end, I mean, as I, as I explained earlier, I left, I left the, uh, the venue early, didn't see Hugh Newman, or Mr. Paget, or Peter, whatever he, however he likes to be called, um, I didn't see his second part of his show either, and, well, I'm home, I've got a few things to sort out, shame I missed the end, but you know, the thing about it is, I don't, um, I don't like the ends of conferences anyway. I mean, I could have stayed. I mean, they, they, I could have gone to the Indian meal. You know, I mean, that's possible. I could have gone, but Colin, like, well, not many of my friends were around. Colin wasn't there because he's he's he had to work. He's working to he's working today, and he's off to Roswell tomorrow anyway. So he's saving his money and saving his time and getting a good night's sleep. Philip, his friend, is obviously going to Roswell with him. Um. Dave didn't want to go, and so I thought, well, I'll just, I don't really want to go to the meal, particularly. Um, yeah, I'm glad, really. Another, another reason I'm glad is there was a very, very nice sort of epilogue to this particular adventure. I uh, got the I walked down that alleyway, back down the alleyway to the, to the main road in, in north of Watford, just by the, by the High Elms Manor, and then got a bus to, to uh, Watford Junction Station. And this this woman came over to me, this, uh, and just asked me for my advice about where she was going. And she couldn't she, she could speak uh, English, but not very well. And um, she suddenly remembered me. <laughs> suddenly she recognised me um, as someone from the conference. At the very same time, I recognised her as someone who'd been at the conference. And um, we got talking. And we had a lovely conversation all the way down the uh, down the railway line into. Houston Station, and then all the way down the Victoria Line to Victoria on the on the underground, and I showed her the way because she wasn't quite sure where to go. So, because she's getting, she had to get the Gatwick Express Air train from the Victoria Station to Gatwick Airport, which meant um, she's flying home. She comes from Norway, and so she's basically going home. She came here Friday night all the way from Norway, and she's going home. We had a talk about the Hestala nights. I talked about Terry Toffness and the day after disclosure video. And things like that and she talked about Simon Parks she came all that way basically because she wanted to see Kerry Cassidy and Simon Parks she traveled all the way from Norway to Watford and I thought I had a, I, I thought I had a long journey coming from Oxford but if I'd stayed to the end I would never have met her and we've exchanged emails and and hopefully we'll stay in touch and I'll probably see her at another event now she make you know I made a new friend that is um there's always a silver line to every cloud. If I'd waited till the end and gone to the Indian restaurant, I probably wouldn't have got talking to her like that. 
And we talked about Simon Parks and everything, and David Icke and the Reptilians, and Chris Turner and his videos. Oh, we had a great conversation. Um, as I said, I don't like the ends of confidence I get. I, as I said at the beginning, you know, I can go into, you know, I'm not, I, I was banned from this conference in the, uh, this, this Outer Limits magazine conference, when, um, in fact, I've never caused trouble at a conference, in fact, I'm often the life and soul of conferences, I, and if anything, I get manic, I get a bit hyper during conferences, and this is why at the end of the conference, I tend to, I tend to experience this, uh, this rather abrupt come down. You know what I mean? And I've, I've talked about this before. I can experience a, a, sh a short but quite intense period of depression. Um, it just wears off, you know, post-pro blues, it wears off. But uh, that's why I, I t leaving before the end of a conference is quite nice for that reason. I did get to say goodbye to everyone like Mike and Sandra and, and Dan Spark from the from the Panwo Radio chat box. I'm glad he was there. Um, and um, who else? So many other people. And new people I met. I met a few new people, you know, some new friends and that. You know. I, picture, I am, yes. Yeah. You are? What's the channel? Don't you know? Don't you recognise me? No. I've met some fans, but they can't remember who I am. <laughs> no, it's uh, Ben the JR Porter. How many subscribers ben. you got? Make sure you get him on oh. there, yeah? Oh, no, it's dropped down. He's a down. big fan. He knows you, who you are. Oh, right. He, he used to be our... Tw oh. It used to be our 100 million, but I think I've lost a couple. What are you lying for? <laughs> what, you got a, got a gold play button? Oh, I, I had it, but, it, you know, I'm worth, I'm worth more than that, man. I'm worth more than that. This guy just likes to See you later. <laughs> Take it easy, guys. <laughs> oh, the price of fame, honestly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm... Um, so I'm going, I'm going back home now to normal life, so-called. Got to call some clients, arrange work for next week. But I've got my book to write. I've got Roswell Revealed to get writing. And that gives, that gives me, you know, something nice to do. And I can edit this film. You know, I always say the best, the best cure for post-conference blues is to stay within the conference world for a while. You know, watch, watch one of the videos or DVDs. You buy something there, like a souvenir, just watch it. Get one of the books you bought from the stores and read it. Call someone up, email them, email somebody you know, um, things like that. So, uh, well, that's it. Just want to say a big thank you to Katrine and all her family and who help organise these events at the, at the High Arms Manor. Thank you very much to them, and thank you very much to. Miles and Peter Padgett and Maria Wheatley, Simon Parks and Tony Topping and um, Kerry Cassidy and Neil, who uh, sort of works with her Project Camelot. A uh, Project Camelot sort of helps her out. Who works with her on that? Um, just say thank you to all those people. Thanks for a wonderful weekend. Thanks to all my friends for being there. It's great to see you. As I said, it's the, it's the social aspect really that matters. The, the speaker's just an excuse to get together, you know? <laughs> and thank you, Hapanwo TV viewers, for watching. Hospital Port is pride and dignity. Stop the New World Order.